So the first thing to do here is, do you see any, uh, say, nucleophiles? Is there a nucleophilic atom around? Um, uh, yes. Yeah. NH3. Well, pardon? NH3. Yeah. And which of those is the nucleophilic atom? Yeah, the nitrogen, not the hydrogen. So we have to identify the precise nucleophilic atom. Now, what makes this into a nucleophile? Well, we've already seen that things with negative charges can be nucleophiles. This doesn't have a negative charge, but what it does have is a lone pair. And oftentimes, things with lone pairs can also be nucleophiles. So it's reasonable for this to be at the tail of the arrow <coughs> because it has a lone pair. All right, um, and then it looks like you wanted to put the head of the arrow over here. Well, it's reasonable for the head of the arrow to be here. Why is that? Let's focus positive. on the you have sorry. A positive charge. Yeah, the delta positive. We have want to especially focus on charges. Carbons with delta positives uh, can be electrophiles. Okay, and this is a good leaving group. So that seems reasonable. So let's figure out what type of reaction this is going to be. So um, what row would we be in in our table? Now um, let's label our alpha carbon. Is our alpha carbon primary, secondary, or tertiary? It's primary. Yeah, we have a primary alpha carbon. Now you can see there's a little bit of a complication about that in the table because there's two rows for primary. Um, by the way, what was, what's the big obstacle to SN2? I don't know if you've seen that discussion. It's sterics. Yeah, steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. That's a really important slogan to memorize for SN2. The big obstacle is steric hindrance that blocks the nucleophile. Um, so, does there seem like there's going to be a lot of steric hindrance here? Well, there certainly isn't much steric hindrance on the alpha carbon. However, sometimes steric hindrance from the beta carbon could also slow us down if there's a lot of steric hindrance there. So we should also look at the beta carbon. Well, maybe you can figure out if this is the alpha carbon, we could call this the beta carbon over here. The beta carbon is the one next to the alpha carbon. Well, is this primary, secondary, or tertiary? Secondary. Yeah, this is secondary. So which row in the table is, gonna, is that going to put us in here? Just going to put us in the Yeah, regular primaries. If this was a tertiary, we'd have to go into that special row for primaries with the tertiary. Uh, beta carbon. Why does that have a special row? Because it has more steric hindrance. Uh, if you have extra steric hindrance on the beta carbon, you might change what the reaction is going to be. But here we don't really have much steric hindrance on the alpha or the beta carbon. So we're in the second row for primaries. And um, who's our nucleophilic atom again? Uh, the NH3, the nitrogen. Nitrogen. Let's focus especially on the atom. Um, and what's its charge? Negative or neutral? It's neutral. Neutral. So let's find the neutral nitrogen in the table. That's right. All right, so what cell are we going to be in? Uh, SN2. SN2 again. But you can see how important it is to focus not just on the atom, but also on the charge. Mm -hmm. Because if we had a nitrogen with a negative charge, we would be over here on the right. Mm -hmm. You can see nitrogen with negative would give us an E2 over here. So we have to focus not just on the atom, but also on the charge. But you can see these hydrogens don't make a big difference. What sure. we want to focus on is the nucleophilic atom. OK, so that nitrogen is coming in. Uh, so this would be a good SN2 reaction. And again, we show the leaving group leaving. I'm going to go ahead here and number the carbons. That's a very useful technique when you're having difficulty drawing the products. So now I'm going to draw the product, and I'm going to use the one atom at a time technique. So I'm going to start with atom number one. Now, who is atom number one connected to? Uh, another carbon. Uh, yeah, and let's be precise. It's connected to atom number two. And who is atom number two connected to? And who is atom number three connected to in the product? In the product to the, um, it's connected to the NH3 or the nitrogen. Yeah, and we want to be specific about exactly which atom it's connected to. So which atom is it connected to? Nitrogen. Good. This is what I mean by the one atom at a time technique. We're just drawing one atom at a time. And how do we figure out which atoms to draw? We're not basing it on what looks good. We're basing it on the arrows. The arrows tell us who's connected to whom. This arrow tells us that the nitrogen is forming a bond to the number three carbon. And who will the nitrogen be connected to in the product? The carbon. And who else? And is there anyone else that haven't drawn the nitrogen? How many hydrogens? Three. Yeah. How do I know it's still connected to three hydrogens? Because I haven't drawn any arrows for these breaking off. Mm -hmm. Since I haven't drawn any arrows, they must still be there. OK. And then the iodide is broken off. Right, so far, this matches exactly what you had written before. So, so far, so good. Mm -hmm. OK. Now, one thing I didn't mention in the last problem is any step of any mechanism, you have to change two charges. 
any step of any mechanism, you have to change two charges, the charge at the initial tail and the charge at the final head. Do you see what I mean by the initial tail and the final head? Which atom here was at the initial tail? Because this is the very first tail in the series. And which atom was at the final head? Because this is the final head in the series. These are, this is not the final head, this is the final head. And this is not the initial tail, this is the initial tail. So what's going to be the charge of this nitrogen in this intermediate or product? Because it started neutral and it's losing electrons. And what's going to be the charge of this iodine at the final head? Okay. It's important to realize that the arrows are supposed to make it super easy to get the right charges. The arrows tell you exactly what the charge will be. This is the only part of your picture that might not have been right at the beginning. I think you were maybe we're not sure about the charges. Uh, it looks like you didn't put the charge oh, in. This is where I started earlier. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. Well, then you were doing good. Uh, except who has the positive charge? The nitrogen. So it's very important to locate the charge in the proper place. It's not on the hydrogens over here. It has to be directly over the nitrogen. Um, as you might have seen from the other videos, the charges are not an afterthought, they're the most important part of the picture. So it's crucial that we get those charges right. Every step of every mechanism, you'll change exactly two charges, the initial tail and the final head, and it should be easy to figure out what the charges are based on the arrows. The hard part isn't, shouldn't be figuring out the charges, the hard part should just be remembering to do the charges. But if you do them for every single step, eventually that should become second nature. Okay, um, and all right, so. That gives us uh, these two things over here. So here we have our two uh, intermediates uh, at this point. Okay, now we have to ask whether this is the final product or whether we should do anything else. Well, is nature happy with this charge over here? Nature doesn't like charges. If there was a way to get rid of the charge, nature would like to do that. Uh, uh, are you familiar with, is there anything that could happen here that, that would allow the nitrogen to get rid of its charge? To depropagate. Yeah, so have you shown the mechanism for that? I haven't. Okay. I stopped here. Okay. So, actually, it seems like uh, even though you weren't happy with your picture, I think you've pretty much come up with the exact right thing so far. Again, even if we've never seen this before, the arrows tell us this must be what this looks like. However, we shouldn't be happy with this as our final product. We'd like to get rid of this charge if we can. So let's go ahead and, uh, so, do you, do you see, how, what arrows would we draw for the next step? Okay, I think you were kind of guessing that we were going to end up with HI, so you were really on the right track here. Yeah. I just didn't know the mechanism to get there exactly. I didn't write it down. Okay, so um, I'm going to put the iodide at the tail. Why is it reasonable for the iodide to be at the tail? Because it's, uh, it's a nucleophile. Because it has a negative charge. The charges are especially helpful. Now, this didn't give me trouble, but notice I think a lot of people would get this wrong. A lot of people would put the head here on the nitrogen. Since after all, it's the nitrogen with the positive charge, right? Why should, uh, so in reality, the head here should go on the hydrogen. But why is the head on the hydrogen if the nitrogen has a positive charge? So let's take a little detour and talk about that because this is, will come up over and over in the course. Um, you don't always put the head on the thing with the positive charge. I actually have a new little handout on that. So. so this is the handout on the effect of charges on reactivity. Yes. So here we're looking at the effect of charges on reactivity. Um, so here we want to see the effect of a positive charge. And notice that what matters is whether the positive charge is on an atom with a incomplete octet or a complete octet. If you have a positive charge and an incomplete octet, then the head of the arrow should be pointing to you. But if you have a positive charge and a complete octet, you can't really, you can't, it won't do you any good to gain more electrons from the nucleophile. And therefore, the head should be on the thing you're attached to. So the example in the handout is like this. If you have a positive charge and a complete octet, then the arrow should look like this. It's the thing you're attached to that should receive the electrons. And then you just pick up the electrons from the bond, which is exactly what you figured out on your own in this example. Okay, so we should know that um, I sit here, the nitrogen has a complete octet, so the arrow goes to the thing it's attached to. Um, the hydrogen is kind of the electrophile in this case. 
By the way, you can see from the handout, pretty much the only thing you'll see in this course with a positive charge and an incomplete octet is a carbocation. So pretty much uh, only carbocations would have positive charges and an incomplete octet. So pretty much any other time you see a positive charge, the, head of the, um, the thing that's going to be the electrophile is actually the thing that's attached to the thing with the positive charge. Okay. All right. So you work that out. And that gives us these are our final problems over here. Uh, sometimes people, oftentimes there's more than one way to do things in OCHEM. If I had told you what the solvent was, you could have also used the solvent to deprotonate the nitrogen here. So you can use either the leaving group or the solvent to deprotonate uh, the leaving group. Most instructors would accept either way. So either of those should be fine. Uh, the key thing here is um, that we weren't happy with this positive charge, so we, this is what we call the deprotonation reaction. So first we did SN2, and then we did deprotonation. 